and welcome. Um, as we, this is a special occasion for us. It's the beginning of our 23rd um, year uh, bringing this program to our community. Uh, so for that period of time, we've been uh, bringing experts, recognized experts um, directly to our community, live speaking to you um, on timely analysis of world events and challenges to US foreign policy. So this is the first of our fall programs of seven. We bring these every other Monday um, on Zoom um, and all our programs are recorded for demand um, at the Chapco Library website, which Joan just referenced. Um, it's easiest to find us if you go to events and look for foreign policy recordings. Um, we have all of our recordings there. Um, they make, they've been excellent and uh, cover a number of topics. So please review them because they are very timely um, as to, so if you miss one, go there. Um, I am June Blanc. I chair this committee along with Tyler Beebe. Maybe Tyler, just wave your hand. Um, Naomi Marrow and Peter Russell. This is our team who you may know from last year. And we are excited to be adding two new members. Um, they are terrific people. They've already been working hard for you um, and the, we're delighted to have them. Um, so the first is Amy Friedman. Um, Amy is raising her hand. She is professor and department chair of political science at Pace University and research fellow at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University. She earned her BA from Barnard, her master's and PhD from New York University. She is an author of numerous books and articles on democracy, ethnic and religious politics in Southeast Asia, and on international uh, relations in Asia. And uh, Carolyn Resnick, Carolyn, you there to wave? There she is waving. Um, you may actually know Carolyn and seen her um, at the library. So recently she was the interim director at the library. Um, and so you may have seen her at that time. And before that, from 92 to uh, 07, she was head of reference and assistant director of the library. And in those intervening years, she was the director of the library of Ruth Keeler Memorial Library at North Salem. She holds a master's of uh, library science from Columbia and a master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin with a major field of Central European history since 1948 or 1648, excuse me. Um, so we are delighted to have these two very knowledgeable additions to our committee. Um, and then we also have another very special treat from you in addition to our speaker. Um, and I'm gonna ask Amy, Amy who um, knows this person well, if she would introduce him to us. Great, um, thank you, June. Thank you for uh, inviting me to become involved with the foreign policy discussion group. I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Matthew Bray Bolton who is a, my colleague and professor of political science at Pace University. He is also the co-director of the International Disarmament Institute, also at Pace University. And he has be, um, been incredibly involved over the years with a campaign to abolish nuclear weapons uh, through his work on ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which was part of a consortium of groups that won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for their work. And Dr. Bolton has been involved since then at the UN in trying to um, get countries to honor their obligations to make good on the harms that were done through years and years of testing of nuclear weapons. Um, and I'm delighted that Dr. Bolton could join us today. Thank you. So today, um, our topic is nuclear proliferation. Um, it's unfortunately a very timely topic. I think 
for years it's always it's been somewhat in our back back in the our, our consciousness um but i think the more recent events and the the nature of becoming a much more um divided factious um world that we're living in um has sort of brought again um the dangers of nuclear proliferation um back onto our radar um in just you know <laughs> an alarm so um we are very fortunate to have michael hanlon with us from brooklyn's and brooklyn brookings institution and also to ask him to sort of set the stage for us. And we will either come away extremely alarmed or maybe slightly more calmed down. So anyway, um, as usual, we will um, ask you, our, our uh, audience, our viewers, um, if you have questions, put them into the chat tab. Um, and then the discussion group, uh, our discussion group will lead with questions um, but as you are listening to them, if things come up that you would like them to amplify, um, would you please just enter the chat and we will read them to Michael um, as the program proceeds. So now let me turn the program over to Naomi Marrow, who is our host for today and will introduce our speaker, Naomi. Thank you, Jim. Um Obviously, we did not succeed in starting with a light topic from the beginning of our season. So here we are with the issue of nuclear power in the hands of many players, some of whom we don't really like much. Uh, I'm going to introduce Michael. Um, we like to keep the introduction short, but his on the Brookings site goes on for three pages. So I will. I used to work at Reader's Digest, so I'll condense all of this. His training was at, for all levels, was at Princeton, so he has a good education beyond description. He's a senior fellow and director of research in foreign policy at Brookings. He specializes in U.S. defense, use of military force, and American national security policy. He directs the Stroh Calvary Center, on security, strategy, and technology. Michael, you've got to get them to shorten the, the, these names. And he's the inaugural holder of the Philip H. Knight Chair in Defense and uh, Strategy and co directs the Africa uh, Security Initiative as well. He's an adjunct professor at Columbia, Georgetown, and GW. And it goes on and on and on. If you want to know more about him, Go to brookings.edu and the odd. So, um, Michael, you want to get started? Thank you, Naomi. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, also, I might add, I'm from Western New York State. I grew up in Canandaigua, another complicated name starting with a C. And uh, so, it's a pleasure to be with friends from downstate, as we as we define the Hudson River Valley and broader. New York suburban area, although I know Chappaqua is just a gorgeous town. I hope someday to get there myself. I haven't been before, but uh, obviously I've always uh, heard good things. And uh, so it's really nice to be with you today, even if virtually. Just a couple of other things to sort of give you a sense of my background on nuclear weapons issues in particular. I was trained as a physicist at Princeton and worked <laughs> initially on a summer project with a guy who was trying to disprove Einstein's general theory of relativity. And so, and by the way, Einstein was right, we were wrong. But uh, thinking back to the origins of the nuclear era and the Manhattan Project and Einstein's role in convincing Roosevelt to start that during World War II, I uh, just thought I'd throw in that reference. My first job in Washington was as a nuclear weapons analyst at the Congressional Budget Office from 1989 to 1994. I started that job in October of 89. The Berlin Wall fell in November. And within a few months, then Senator Joe Biden had tasked us at CBO with doing a study examining possible deep cuts in nuclear forces and also what the budgetary savings associated with such deep cuts might be. 
This was back in an era when, as you'll recall, some of you will recall, uh, the United States seemed to care about deficits. And so if you could link deep nuclear cuts to not only a safer world and a less hostile world and an end to the Cold War, but also to budgetary savings, uh, you might actually get some attention and interest from folks. So we did that study and we looked at options as low as 1,000 nuclear warheads on a side. Back then, each of the superpowers had close to 30,000 total nuclear warheads each. And the world had something approaching 100,000 in if, if you added in all the um, extra material, at least, that was potentially available to make nuclear weapons. The world had the ability to generate 100,000 nuclear weapons and had something like 65 to 70,000 actually deployed, not all of them long range. Today, we're down to about 10,000, by the way. And uh, the Chinese are increasing their arsenal. So are uh, so are the North Koreans and probably the Pakistanis, but the larger established great powers, Russia and the United States, are more or less holding steady. And so there, there has been some positive progress, even if not quite as much as Senator Biden or Vice President Biden or President Biden might have preferred over those same years, or Matthew and Amy, for that matter. And I look forward to hearing more from them in the discussion, because uh, they've you know done a lot of work on this subject. And and Matthew's work with the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons is quite important to bring into this discussion as well. So I'll look forward to that in, a, in about a half hour. That's a little bit about me. I wrote a book about 12 years ago when people like Matthew and my good friend and colleague, Bruce Blair, uh, the late Bruce Blair, who was at Brookings in the 90s and uh, later founded various initiatives, they were working on a project sometimes described as Global Zero which was part of or related to the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And I wrote a book in which I said, I think the advocates for global zero are a little bit optimistic about the timeline, but I think they have the right vision. And in, in fact, we've all agreed to the vision. The vision is codified legally in the 1968 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, in which there's a bargain between the nuclear haves and the have-nots, and the nuclear haves promise to try to get rid of their arsenals over time, and that's part of the pledge they make to the nuclear have-nots to accept the idea that the have-nots should never get nuclear weapons. So that's the logic, not asking for a permanent hierarchy of some countries being allowed weapons and the others not, but instead all of us working towards abolition or disarmament. So um, I look forward to some of the nuances of where Matthew and I and others may be coming from later on, but that was in 2011 when I published that book. Of course, within the next couple of years, Vladimir Putin had returned to the Kremlin and Xi Jinping had taken power in China and both of them embarked on much more assertive, even aggressive international security policies. Both of them felt the United States was throwing its weight around too much in world affairs and wanted to push back. And so the, the 15 or 20 years of relative comedy and cooperation that we saw among the great powers started to dissipate. And of course, we all know that in today's world, it's a far cry from a cooperative great power kind of you know international environment so it's going to be harder to get back on track with arms control so that's my long warm-up to tell you a little bit about who i am in sort of nuclear weapons terms my overall job at brookings is more to look at regional security environments and overall u.s defense posture and strategy so my comments today will largely be looking at country by country region by region problems and trying to approach the nuclear weapons question from that point of view but I'll also add a couple of thoughts at the end about the future of arms control, both great power arms control, and then also the kind of issues that Matthew has worked on that hopefully will tee up his comments before we all go to your thoughts and questions as well. So let me begin with a little bit of the good news, because I think it was June who said, or maybe it was uh, Joan at the beginning, no, I think or maybe you, Naomi, we started, I guess all three of you alluded to the fact we started with uh, the fall semester, so to speak, with a pretty depressing topic or potentially depressing. And we see nuclear threats coming out of the mouth of Vladimir Putin from time to time in the course of this ongoing tragedy in Ukraine. And we see Iran trying to get closer and closer to the brink of nuclear weapons capability without necessarily crossing over it. North Korea keeps building bombs, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there's no telling what comes next. But let me also give you a little bit of reason for hopefulness. 
And you'll be aware of many of these points, but let me bring them up again. First of all, there's only one country on earth that's tested nuclear weapons in the 21st century, and that's North Korea. And unfortunately, I think they've done it six times. And the United States has been expecting a seventh really throughout the entire Biden presidency, and it hasn't happened for whatever reason. But still, it's relatively hopeful to think that the great powers themselves, the five established sort of codified nuclear weapon states, also the same five countries that are permanent members of the UN Security Council, Russia, China, the United States, France, and Britain, none of us have tested nuclear weapons since the mid-1990s. The United States has not tested since 1992, when Congress essentially forced George H.W. Bush to accept a moratorium on nuclear testing as part of an overall defense bill for that year. We have not tested in the atmosphere, speaking of environmental and human and health consequences of nuclear weapons testing, we have not tested in the atmosphere since the early 1960s. Really, nobody has. There might have been one South Korean test that was attempt that they tried to hide. Uh, and we picked up, we think, around 1977, if I'm remembering my year correctly. But basically, nobody's been testing weapons out in the open since the early 1960s. Nobody except North Korea has tested nuclear weapons at all this century, as best we can tell. And there are several hundred listening stations around the world that are interneted not only through U.S. intelligence, but through an international multilateral network. And so we're pretty confident that this is actually true, that there haven't been nuclear tests. In fact, when the Indians and Pakistanis did their rounds of testing in 1998, they um, had a couple of duds along the way. The Pakistanis in particular tests that were less than one kiloton, less than the equivalent of a thousand tons of TNT. So, you know, 20 times smaller than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. But we still picked up those tests with our remote seismic detection methods. So the verification is pretty good. And uh, we're pretty confident that nobody has, you know, set off a nuclear weapon over that time. Also, today the world has nine nuclear weapons capable countries. And that's, you know, at one level, nine too many. But it also is much less than what John F. Kennedy predicted when he was president and he looked out and he saw the developments on the international landscape. He came off dealing with the Berlin and Cuban Missile Crises. Uh, he saw the United States and the Soviet Union embarked on these huge nuclear buildups, even after Eisenhower uh, and, and, and uh, Brezhnev and others had already embarked on nuclear weapons buildups in the 50s. And Kennedy thought, you know, this was spinning out of control. And he thought there would be perhaps 20 nuclear weapon states by the mid-1970s and maybe a couple of dozen or more by the end of the century. So compared to that prognostication, we're doing pretty well. And in fact, I think it's largely a tribute to uh, the work of arms controllers, but it's also a tribute to the United States building alliance networks that made countries feel relatively secure without their own nuclear weapons because they knew that the United States and other allies might come to their defense if they were attacked, not only with nuclear forces if need be, but even with conventional forces. And so the American strategy of building up alliances in Europe and East Asia uh, and strong commitments to a number of countries in the Middle East, I think, discouraged people from pursuing their own nuclear weapons. And that's been a favorable outcome. Also, it's pretty hard to build nuclear weapons, and the world has worked to control the technologies, not only the weapons themselves, the material, the enriched uranium and plutonium, but the kinds of machinery needed to build those weapons and to create the plutonium or highly enriched uranium that is required to start a chain reaction. Uh, many of you will know that there's only two materials on Earth that will create a self-sustaining and accelerating chain reaction, which is, of course, what gives you the nuclear weapons explosion effect. And that's highly enriched uranium or uranium-235, as well as plutonium. The good news about those two substances, plutonium does not exist in nature. It only exists if human beings create it in nuclear reactors. And uranium does exist in nature, but it's in the form of, of metal in the ground that's primarily uranium-238, a different isotope of uranium. And I'm not going to throw a whole lot of physics at you today, but it is important to know that U-238 is the predominant form of uranium in any 
uranium metal you find anywhere on Earth, 99.3% of all uranium is uranium-238, and it's all interwoven with the whatever U-235 is there, and that material will not sustain a chain reaction. U-238 will not. It doesn't, I, I won't get into the physics, but it doesn't generate the necessary neutrons to then go off and cause more fissions in a, in a chain reaction, a sequencing or a cascading effect. And therefore, if you try to use U-238 to start a nuclear fission uh, device, it won't work. You have to do a lot of complex things to the uranium to gasify it and then spin it in various ways and separate out the U-235 from the U-238. It's very tedious and laborious, energy intensive. And that's one more reason why most countries haven't tried to do it. You can figure out how to do it if you're willing to throw a bunch of billions of dollars at the problem. And Saddam Hussein was making progress, as you'll recall, in the 1980s until we got into Iraq and uncovered what he was up to and forced him gradually to dismantle it. So, you know, it doesn't take an industrial superpower anymore to make a nuclear weapon, but it does take real resources and time and effort. Okay, so that's some of the good news. Now, I think what Naomi and I agreed that I should do is to think a little bit about hotspots. And let's talk about those nine countries that have nuclear weapons and maybe one or two that don't, but could. And then I'll again conclude with a brief, broader global perspective on the future of arms control and look forward to the discussion. And maybe the best place to start is the place where we see nuclear weapons in the news most often, and that's with Russia and Ukraine. And we've seen that sometimes Vladimir Putin, who wields the world's largest nuclear arsenal, has threatened to use nuclear weapons in the Ukraine war. And he's made that threat to try to keep us out of the war. He's also made that threat early in 2022 when his forces had their disastrous start and then were sort of forced to flee. And it wasn't clear if they were doing so badly through the course of the spring, summer, and early fall of 2022 that Putin might think about using nuclear weapons just to sort of stem the speed of advance of the Ukrainian forces against his own. As you know, at this point, that war is largely a stalemate. And so nobody's really thinking, as best we can tell, about using nuclear weapons on the battlefield. By the way, Ukraine doesn't have any anymore. They did inherit about 2,000 from the Soviet Union and at our request gave them up. So even though we don't have a treaty commitment to Ukraine, I do feel we have a certain strategic and moral commitment because we promised, along with Britain and Russia in 1994, to help essentially have their back if they would be so good as to give up that fraction of the Soviet nuclear arsenal that they inherited when the Soviet Union dissolved. So, you know, we don't have, again, a formal legal or treaty commitment to Ukraine, but we do have some history that I think means we have a certain obligation to them to try to at least help them from the worst case in their war against Russia. But be that as it may, the nuclear taboo has held in this war. Uh, Putin hasn't really gotten close to using nuclear weapons. There's some discussion that he got a little bit closer in the fall of 2022 than we would have wished, but uh, I, I'm skeptical and I'm skeptical he'll use them. For one thing, most of the world is still doing business with Russia and Putin would jeopardize that if he were to use nuclear weapons because there is such a taboo against their use. And even countries that are willing to look the other way as Putin uses artillery against innocent civilians in Ukraine in one of the more heinous and barbar barbaric wars that we've all seen in a while. But he, uh, even though countries seem in some cases willing to do that, Putin doesn't really seem to think he could get away with nuclear weapons use scot-free. If it came down to the survival of his regime or the protection of the core of Russia, I think he might. But at this juncture, the interesting thing to my mind is that he hasn't yet, even though he's in a war where there are more than 100,000 Russian dead. So um, take that as you will, and we'll come back to it later, but I find the Russia-Ukraine war as horrible as it is, and as scary as it still could be, to be in a nuclear weapons sense, in a relatively reassuring, in reminding us why there are powerful reasons for countries not to use nuclear weapons, 
even when they are in big wars, and even when they have 6,000 of them, like Russia does today. So let me move over to Northeast Asia. I'll do sort of a clockwise uh, tour around uh, the Eurasian littoral as I discuss these various nuclear powers and would-be powers. But let me now talk about North Korea. And this has been a country that, in the course of the 21st century, has unfortunately developed a real nuclear arsenal. We don't really know if the North Koreans could hit the United States with nuclear weapons. The, I would say the answer is probably not. And we do have a limited amount of defense deployed in Alaska and California anyway, that would give us some chance of shooting down any missiles. Kim Jong-un has never had a truly representative, successful long range ICBM test. Whenever he's tested intercontinental ballistic missiles, he's done it on trajectories that have gone way up and then way down so that they wouldn't land anywhere too close to the United States or other countries that would take unkindly to that kind of a test. And so uh, Kim Jong-un, I don't believe, can really have confidence in his missile arsenal for long-range strike, but he almost certainly has the ability to destroy much of South Korea and maybe even Japan, maybe even hit Guam, and outside chance he could reach Hawaii or the continental United States. I doubt it, and I certainly don't think he wants to, because he knows that, that, that if he ever did that, it's virtually inevitable that we would destroy his regime and him. But he does have that capability. And moreover, he's developing mobile missiles that also have solid fuel, which means they don't need extensive preparation, which means we might not have the opportunity to preempt those missiles before they're launched. Bottom line, North Korea probably could, in crisis or war, threaten South Korea with effective nuclear attack and kill literally millions of people. But deterrence seems to be holding. And the fact that the United States is so committed to South Korea's defense seems to be an important element here as well. South Korea does not have nuclear weapons. There's an interesting debate in South Korea about whether they should. This is a relatively newer debate, newish debate. Like I told you, I'm gonna talk about one or two countries that might get the bomb. South Korea is one of them. Interestingly, the South Korean public has a majority sentiment in favor of getting the bomb. And the Donald Trump presidency probably didn't help here because as you'll recall, Trump often threatened the South Koreans with the pullout of American forces because he didn't think they were playing fair economically, whether in terms of manufactured goods for the commercial world or in terms of how much money they would provide for the 30,000 US troops in Korea to maintain their bases and their living. Uh, Trump was a little bit wrong in his critique because the South Koreans are actually fairly generous and they spend two and a half percent of their own GDP on their own military, which is high by American allied standards. So it's a little perplexing how Trump put uh, South Korea in his crosshairs, but he did. And the South Koreans certainly know it. And so uh, I'm not suggesting they're going to start a nuclear bomb program the minute Trump might be reelected but they will be watching and listening to every single word. I was in Korea in May at a conference where one of Trump's defense advisors was present. And I guarantee you every single thing he said about the US military commitment to South Korea and about South Korean options was listened to extremely attentively. His name is Bridge Colby. And then Mike Pompeo was there as well and, and didn't speak for Trump, but same kind of thing. Uh, Every, every kind of hint, every kind of body language was carefully scrutinized to see uh, what it might mean and imply about the US commitment to South Korea. Because certainly if the United States were not as committed to South Korea as we've been since 1950, then all of a sudden North Korea may feel it has a plausible path to coercion by threatening North South Korea with a nuclear attack unless it agrees to some form of reunification or some form of payment or whatever. And so I think, I hope very much we don't put the South Koreans in the position of having to decide whether the American commitment is reliable enough that they need to get their own bomb. But that's one place where you could see this debate intensify. In Japan, by the way, there's a little bit of this debate, but not as much. Japan being, of course, the only country ever the victim of a nuclear attack, a much stronger anti-nuclear taboo uh, in Japan probably than maybe anywhere else on earth, but certainly even more than in South Korea. And the US-Japan alliance is 
in stronger shape, I think, overall, at least in the context of a possible Trump presidency, than the US ROK alliance, the US South Korea alliance. So I think that Japan will not be a country that seriously considers getting a bomb anytime soon, but we'll see. Okay, now China and the United States. Uh, this is possibly the scariest situation. Although North Korea, of course, is the more extreme regime. And I don't consider the Chinese government for all of its mistakes and autocratic ways and harshness. I don't consider it to be nearly as criminal or evil as the North Korean regime. After all, the Chinese government has pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And it's been a driver of economic growth in much of the region, sometimes in a somewhat exploitative way towards its neighbors, but other times in a more beneficial way. In any event, I don't think we need to view the Chinese as evil to necessarily still worry that there could be nuclear risks associated with the state of play. And the most clear path to uh, a nuclear crisis involving China and the United States would probably center on Taiwan. You, of course, remember that Taiwan is considered by China to be part of the homeland, part of the core territory of the nation. But since 1949, when the Chinese communists won the civil war on mainland China, Taiwan has been ruled first by the losers of that civil war who fled the mainland, and then now by a more democratic um, Taiwan that elects its leaders for the last 30 some years through elections, through democracy, and isn't so much made up of the losers of the Chinese Civil War, but just uh, people who don't necessarily want to live under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. And so the standoff continues. The United States does not have a formal commitment to defend Taiwan. We don't even have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, going back to Nixon and Kissinger. But we do have a, something called the Taiwan Relations Act and various memos and assurances towards the Taiwan people. And we tell them, basically, if you get attacked by China, in an unprovoked way, because China wants to forcibly reunify the country as it defines it, we will probably come to your defense. But we leave some room for interpretation, some gray area, and some room for presidential and congressional discretion. So it's not entirely clear if we would intervene. President Biden has said four times when asked, yes, I would direct the United States military to intervene to help protect Taiwan except US policy is still deliberately and intentionally vague on this point, preserving options either to defend or not, depending on what we think caused the crisis and what we think would be the best way to resolve it. Uh, Biden didn't make any reference, however, to what Congress's role might be in any such momentous decision about going to war against China. And of course, the constitution gives Congress the power to declare war. And most presidents since 1945, they haven't asked Congress for declarations of war, but they've asked for some kind of authorization. And Biden didn't make any reference to whether he would ask Congress for authorization. Biden also did not discuss whether he thought we really could successfully defend Taiwan against a Chinese attack. Bearing in mind, Taiwan's only 100 miles from China and several thousand miles from the United States. And China's military budget is now the second largest in the world. They have a lot of advanced missiles and other conventional weapons that could really uh, wreak havoc with a lot of Taiwan's infrastructure. So that gets to my central point. And sorry to bring you through all that uh, history to re remind you for those of you who, who wanted the little quick, quick history jog of memory. But the point being that there's ambiguity here and that potentially could lead to deterrence failure if the Chinese thought they could get away with an attack, either because an American president, whoever that might be, doesn't want to come defend Taiwan. And Trump just said over the summer that he might not because he doesn't think Taiwan's doing enough to protect itself. And therefore, why should the United States do so? And what if the Chinese hear Trump saying that, decide they can get away with an attack without American intervention, but then Trump changes his mind after the attack, the same way that Harry Truman changed his mind in 1950 after having promised that we would not go to war to defend South Korea, the Truman administration then 80 degrees after the attack and decided it could not let that aggression go unanswered. And I worry the same kind of thing could happen 
in regard to the U.S.-China relationship over Taiwan. So these are the kind of concerns that could lead to a war. In any event, one side or the other, China or the United States, could exaggerate its own military capabilities or otherwise believe a war would be quicker and easier and then wind up getting into a war that becomes protracted, whether it's an invasion attempt or a blockade or something else. And whoever's losing that war, whether it's China or the United States, then has to ask, am I willing to lose this war? Or what are my other options? One is to attack the interests of the adversary somewhere else besides the Taiwan Strait. So we could try to cut off Chinese oil coming from the Persian Gulf, for example. The other option is to make nuclear threats. And that's where it gets scary. And you don't have to actually, you know, decide that you're willing to risk nuclear holocaust or apocalypse to make that threat. If you think you can get away with it, if you think you can control the process of making threats and the other side responding, if you think that you care more about this issue than the other side and therefore they'll back down if you make this threat, you might be tempted to do it, even though you recognize that one small possibility at the end of this chain of interaction is in fact nuclear apocalypse. But you might persuade yourself that that could be avoided and the other side, in fact, will back down because it doesn't care as much. And this is essentially what John F. Kennedy did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He decided that the Soviets would realize that we cared more and that we had various conventional options to handle the situation as well. But even if we couldn't, and by the way, we probably would have failed if we had tried, uh, and the Soviets would have had the ability to hit the United States with nuclear weapons. Kennedy was willing to force the issue. Now, he, I think he wisely made some quiet concessions as well to try to defuse the issue through diplomacy. But nobody should think it's completely unthinkable for China or the United States to threaten nuclear weapons use against the other, because we have a lot of history from the Cold War, much of it American history, that shows that even this country was prepared to make nuclear threats in the past even when doing so might have led to nuclear retaliation against the United States when we thought the stakes were high enough and we felt we could control the risks or manage the threats better than the other side. So that's where I still worry about where we are with the United States and China. I know I'm getting close to where I should be winding down. So let me just make a couple of quick comments about South Asia, then the Middle East, and then global arms control. South Asia should never be ignored in this kind of a conversation because two of the world's nine nuclear weapons powers, India and Pakistan, are in South Asia, and they still have a very unsettled relationship. They dispute the territory of Kashmir and who should be in charge of that. Uh, Pakistan created terrorist organizations that it usually tries to rein in a bit, but that have carried out terrible attacks against India before and could do so again. And if that happened, India might retaliate. And if that happened, Pakistan might feel that its existence was at risk and start putting nuclear weapons on its F-16s. And so there are various dynamics by which a crisis in South Asia could intensify. The United States wouldn't have any military obligation to intervene because we're not allies with either country. But if 1.5 billion people on Earth are in crosshairs of nuclear attack, the whole world's going to care at some level. And so that risk shouldn't be forgotten. Again, if I'm looking for silver linings or a little bit of good news here and there, I would say that India and Pakistan have done a pretty good job of pooling things off for the last decade or so, but not always. And there have been little scares and flare-ups, and the issue is still fundamentally unresolved, the territorial disagreement. So keep your eye on that area. But of course, most Americans keep their eye even more on the Middle East. And so let me say a word about Iran. Iran's been close to being able to build a nuclear weapon for a couple of decades. Fascinatingly, it has not made a sprint for the finish line, partly because it worries that we could attack them if we saw that happening. There have been international inspectors in Iran for most of that period. And and so and there's still some ability to get information about Iran's nuclear program. And so Iran knows that we're watching, knows Israel is watching, 
and knows there's a real decent chance that we would attack their uranium enrichment facilities, even though they're buried deep underground, if we saw them making an all-out sprint to get a nuclear weapon. By that, I mean essentially enriching uranium-235 up to 90% U-235. When you get to that level, you're way above the fuel needed for a nuclear reactor, and you really are making that uh, kind of U-235 concentrate for a fission bomb. And therefore, there's not much ambiguity or doubt anymore about what you're up to. So Iran has come closer and closer to being able to get to 90%. And it's violated a lot of the terms from the Obama era Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. But of course, Trump pulled us out of that. So it doesn't feel any obligation to the United States anyway. There are other parties to the accord. But Iran's been basically bending the rules, breaking some of the rules, but still not making the all-out final decision to get the bomb. I think Iran feels that um, unless it were attacked in a major way by Israel or the United States, you know, with an effort to overthrow its regime, it wouldn't really need the bomb. Iran's more of a master of covert action and terrorism. So the bomb is sort of a, a nice backup, but uh, not really crucial to the way it does business day to day. And much of the world is still dealing with Iran economically. Iran probably realizes that could be lost if the whole world saw it racing for nuclear weapons capability. Or it might just be waiting for the United States and or Israel to be distracted long enough or led by a president who doesn't seem to care about the issue that they can make that final push without the risk of you know, precipitating that preemptive strike. So I don't know exactly what's driving Iranian calculus here but it's probably some combination of those kinds of considerations. And I don't know at what point they're just going to say, you know what, we sort of want to have the bomb. We want the prestige. We want the counter to Israel and the United States. And if they ever do become the world's 10th nuclear weapon state, then countries like Turkey and Saudi Arabia will probably have to ask themselves, do they want to get the bomb as well? And that will be a function, their decisions, I believe, would be a function of their relations with Iran at that point, and also their relations with the United States and other regional countries. If we are projecting and maintaining enough of a sense of commitment to the security of the broader Persian Gulf, I'm not so sure that Turkey or Saudi Arabia would want to waste the 10 or $20 billion or whatever, uh, as well as the international opprobrium that would come with becoming another nuclear weapon state. So. Even if Iran got the bomb, I am guessing that we could deter them from using it, and I am guessing that we could prevent a cascade of proliferation in the broader region. But it wouldn't be easy, and it would take a lot of work, and there would be risks. And Matthew may want to I'll look forward to his thoughts, how he sizes up the risks. Uh, I would agree, or I would acknowledge that there are more than zero, that if Iran got the bomb, somebody else might too. So that's the potential for a proliferation domino effect, if you will. Okay, final thoughts. As I step back, again, there are a lot of dangers involving nuclear weapons in these various hotspots. And the fact that we've had 79 years of nuclear peace, that nuclear weapons have still only been used twice in history, August 6th and August 9th, 1945, by the greatest country that ever existed on earth, ironically. Uh, that should be some solace that humans are not totally crazy. On the other hand, the idea that we can have human-led organizations and emotional leaders, leaders willing to launch war, leaders willing to see people die, innocent people die, uh, like Vladimir Putin does, uh, the idea that we could live in a world like this indefinitely with a lot of nuclear weapons and no further nuclear weapons use is unpersuasive to me. So um, I hope we can get back seriously on the track that Matthew and others have wanted to help push us along, even though we've essentially you know, lost a couple of decades of time now. And the prospects for getting rid of nuclear weapons in my lifetime, I think, are almost zero. But I hope they're not almost zero in my kid's lifetime or in my grandkids. That would be one broad comment. A second broad comment would be that if we think about bilateral arms control, you know, old-fashioned U.S.-Russian arms control, there still is a treaty in effect, although it's 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 suspended now by Russia, called the New START Treaty. It lasts until year after next, 2026. And it puts a cap on the long-range 
arsenals of both Russia and the United States at 1,550 warheads each. Although there's some funky counting rules, so it may be closer to 1,800 each. And then we all have shorter range weapons and surplus weapons. So that's why I said earlier, Russia has about 6,000 nuclear bombs and we have about 4,500. Britain and France each have a couple hundred. India and Pakistan may be approaching that level themselves. Israel probably has 100, 150, 200. North Korea probably has 50 to 75. And China now has announced that it wants to have 1,500, or I should say United States intelligence has assessed that China wants to have 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035, which would then bring it up to a relatively comparable level of our own arsenal, especially if China puts those weapons primarily on long range systems, then they would be approaching the size of the United States in terms of long range strategic arsenal. So what do you do with arms control in this situation? And it no longer really makes sense just to limit Russian and American arsenals when China's building up to compete with us. By the way, I don't think it's all that surprising China wants to compete with us. What I find surprising is that it took China this long to make that decision. I, I am very confident that if the roles were reversed and we had an opportunity to bring ourselves up to parity with the established nuclear superpower, that we would have done this long ago. So the fact that China's doing it now doesn't make me assume they want a nuclear war. I just think they want to checkmate our arsenal. So in a future Taiwan Strait contingency, we don't feel we can use nuclear threats against them. By the way, bear in mind, we've done it before. I mentioned the various times, like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the US threatened attack. But Eisenhower threatened even nuclear weapons use against China in the 1950s over a Taiwan crisis or two of that period. So the Chinese, I think, want to make sure we can't do that again. I think that's the main reason they want a large arsenal. But anyway, it raises the question, how can you do arms control in a world where now China is reaching into nuclear superpower ranks itself? And there are two ways to think about this. One is to try to persuade China and Russia that their forces should be counted together and that our forces can be counted together with Britain and France because we're NATO allies. And there should be the same overall ceiling for both alliances, if you will. That's one way to think about it. The problem is, first of all, China's gonna have a lot more weapons pretty soon than Britain and France combined. So I don't think they would agree to this deal. And secondly, I don't really wanna push Russia and China into each other's arms permanently. They don't really have an alliance the same way we have an alliance with Britain and France. And I don't want them to feel like they should. And they are cooperating a lot right now in regard to the Ukraine war. But even in this war, China is not shipping weapons to Russia, they're giving them technology, which is bad enough, but it's different. And so I would rather not go to that approach, even if we could persuade China and Russia to accept it. What I think is more appealing, if we can get back to a point by 2026 or whenever, when we can talk to Russia again about things like this, I would rather try to extend the New START Treaty and then invite other countries, including China, Britain, and France, to share their own databases on their own nuclear forces, to join Russia and the United States in verification processes and inspections, and then to give information about our longer term nuclear modernization plans and really make transparency the primary goal and objective rather than uh, caps per se. And the implication here is that nobody should hopefully be embarking on a big buildup. And if they do, you, have the opportunity to ask them why as you determine what response you'd like to have yourself. But that's, I think, where we should go with strategic offensive arms control. Very last word on missile defense. On, you know, right now the United States only has a very limited national missile defense capability, and that's based in California and Alaska, aimed primarily at North Korean missiles that would be taking a polar route and therefore overfly Alaska on their way towards the continental United States. And that's why the missile defense systems are based where they are. We could try to have a light, truly national missile defense system that could handle an Iranian threat if it ever emerged. Or also we have to think harder about cruise missiles and drones. And I'm not suggesting we can or should protect every small city along our coast, 
from a hypothetical attack from a drone launched off of a tanker out at, you know, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. But I do think we need a fresh round of thinking about some limited capability to defend key assets and uh, to be able to deal with more than just a North Korean long-range ICBM threat. Not suggesting we should be in a hurry to build it, and I don't want to spend a lot of money on it, but it may be time to at least reopen that way of thinking. As you know, the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, that was part of that original flurry of arms control in the Johnson and Nixon years, is no more. President George W. Bush withdrew the United States from that treaty in 2002, uh, explained to Vladimir Putin his reasoning. And uh, we haven't really built up a huge missile defense since. I don't think we should, but I think we may want to consider more limited targeted capabilities, uh, again, near various key industries, various key uh, parts of our infrastructure. So that's a little bit of a broader agenda. Naomi and others, I don't know if I strayed in too many different directions to have this pulled together coherently, but it, even if I did, I hope now Matthew and Amy and the rest can can bring us back and, and tighten things up, and I look forward to the reactions and further thoughts. Thank you. You're still muted, my friend. Thank you again. I think I'll go have a Valium or two after that overview. Um, I want to ask a quick question. Do we assume that these bombs in the different countries are viable? Because many of them are really old. Well, unfortunately, yes, we assume they are viable. Uh, because first of all, nuclear weapons, what ages fastest is probably the conventional explosive inside the bomb that's used to begin the compression of the nuclear material so it will then reach critical mass and start a chain reaction. And that material we replace in our bombs, even though we haven't tested since 1992, we're spending you know $20 billion a year on stockpile stewardship, as we call it, at Los Alamos National Laboratory and Livermore and Sandia and a few other of the nation's crown jewels. And we're constantly monitoring and updating the circuitry, but especially the conventional explosive but other countries know how to do that too. And, you know, I mentioned that a couple of the Indian and Pakistani bombs and a couple of the North Korean tests were duds, but the last ones weren't. And making a nuclear explosion go off, there's a lot of things you have to do to get to the point where you can try that. But the physics is by now pretty well known too. Mm -hmm. And so I forget who it was who said that as far as we know, Everyone who's ever tried to build a nuclear weapon and then tested their nuclear weapon has succeeded on the first try. Doesn't always mean the explosion was as big as they wanted, but I'm afraid that nuclear weapons are probably reasonably reliable, which there is a, a silver lining. It means we don't have to keep detonating our bombs to be pretty confident they would go off. But um, I'm afraid other countries can be pretty confident theirs would work. The harder thing is to deliver the weapon. And this is yeah. where geography gives us some sanctuary, uh, or at least some relative protection, not sanctuary. And that's where a small missile defense combined with maybe some ability for offensive preemption, preemptive action, once you see the other side starting to launch, and you can limit the size of its attack, and then you can try to shoot down whatever small number it gets into space headed towards our country that may offer reasonably good promise for defending our homeland. I don't think it really offers that much promise for protecting South Korea or even Japan or much of Europe. But um, I think it could, I think we still have some pretty good hope of being able to survive a nuclear war against a North Korea or an Iran. But I think their weapons would probably go off. Now, um, one last thing, they haven't tested those weapons after accelerating them on a rocket and sending them into space. So there is a this, this possibility that the process of being accelerated, launched into space, and then decelerated could destroy the warhead if they haven't done a good job with their reentry vehicles or other protections. So in that sense, the weapon might go off if it's stationary, but it might not go off at the end of that long 8,000-mile trajectory. So that's one more reason you, you, you can hope that you know we would escape the worst in the event of this kind of scenario. But nobody wants to find out, of course.
but we should all go to Joan's program on disasters and be ready for them. Matthew, I give you the first question and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for, for having me and inviting me. This has been really fascinating and I'm um, happy to see that uh, there is so many people who um, on a Monday morning um, are interested in uh, the kind of state of our world. That makes me um, optimistic about the world. Um, and thank you, Michael, for your your um, survey of 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 the good and the bad. Um, I'm I'm preparing right now uh, a lecture for Wednesday about some of these same topics. So I um, I will give you credit, of course, but I, I, I'll be drawing on some of what you've had to say. So thank you. Um, I my question is sort of um, has sort of two strands to them, but they're related, which is that I like I think what you provided us is a really good overview of the state of where we are um, in Europe and Asia. Um, but what I'm sort of interested in is where we how we move from here. And if if we take um, the kind of legal mandate of zero, which is in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, how we get there. Um, and my 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 hypothesis, and I'm interested in what you have to say about this is, you know, your your focus on Europe and Asia has left out a lot of the world. Um, we've got Africa, we've got Latin America, we've got the so-called hole in the donut of the Pacific region, uh, where a lot of the nuclear tests um, happen. Um, and I'm wondering what it looks like if we add all that back into the story. Most of those states um, are supporters of the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is a categorical ban on nuclear weapons. Um, either they have joined the treaty or they have voted for, for resolutions um, on that. And part of that treaty also includes provisions on assisting victims and remediating environments affected by nuclear tests, um, such as in the Pacific or in Kazakhstan or Algeria. Um, and I'm sort of wondering what it looks like when you tell this um, story of nuclear weapons from the point of view of Africa, Latin America, and the Pacific, um, or the point of view of the the affected people, and whether attention to that those kind of like human dimensions and the strong nuclear taboo in those places might help us to understand this uh, an answer to the question of of how we get to zero. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And by the way, yeah, thank you for joining today and for all you do on these issues. And uh, I also should have apologized to folks earlier that I'm wearing these sunglasses to save my eyes. Uh, the Zoom screens get to me, but um, here, just so you can see, that's what I really look like. So now I'll spare you and put them back on uh, and spare my own eyes. But those are excellent questions. In fact, I was just meeting last week with a group of diplomats from Brazil and they, you know, wide ranging discussion and nuclear weapons did come up. And they gave themselves a deserved pat on the back as one of the few countries that's ever embarked on a nuclear weapons program only to stop. And of course, Ukraine gets some credit there and Kazakhstan, which also, I believe, inherited some uh, Soviet nuclear weapons initially after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And I think Argentina, along with Brazil, they were competing for a while. South Africa gave up the bomb. And so, you're right. Some of the, I mean, you didn't put it this way, but the spirit of your comment, there, there are some hopeful and strong signals being sent from the developing world in particular against the use, but also even against the possession of nuclear weapons. So I would acknowledge those points and agree with them. I would also say, though, that maybe just to create a little, uh, you know, dialectic in this framing that I had the privilege of interviewing the president of Congo for a Brookings public event in July, and nuclear weapons certainly did not come up in that conversation. I don't think they would have come up even if the interview had lasted two or three hours instead of one, because he has a lot more immediate problems on his mind, including the war in the East in his country, which of course is extremely brutal and is being fought with conventional weapons at most. And, um, and so for many countries in the developing world, as you well know, they have other issues on their minds. And the fact that they haven't embarked on a nuclear weapons program is partly because they don't want to waste the money for something that doesn't really solve any of their problems. And to their credit, you know, there are a lot of 
a lot of problems with civil war in Africa, a lot of problems with transnational criminal organizations yeah. in Latin America, but they don't tend to fight interstate wars in those continents. And therefore their need for nuclear weapons has been perceived as less. So we should all maybe try to take a page out of their book and let them take some credit for setting an example that maybe more of the rest of us in the so-called first world or industrialized world should try to emulate. So I'm still not completely answering your question, but I'm suggesting different you know, ways to approach it, at least tangentially. In terms though of actually trying to make a move towards nuclear disarmament now, I don't, what I, what I argued in my book, my 2011 book, is I don't know that this is the time until we can resolve the major irredentist and territorial disputes among the main powers. Because I worry that if you try to move towards zero in a world where China still thinks it deserves to control Taiwan and Russia still thinks it deserves to control Ukraine, that you get all sorts of perverse incentives as you start to disarm for people to believe they might have windows of opportunity or benefit from cheating and keep weapons while the other side doesn't and then trot them out as a way to try to coerce a resolution to the issue at hand uh, in a favorable way. So what I argued in my book is I'm in favor of the vision. I don't know how well you knew Bruce Blair, but um, you know he was one of my really good friends. I thought the world of him, he sadly passed away about three years ago. And he had done a lot on Global Zero, one of the founders, I think, of the movement. And so his moral voice was always powerfully in my ear. So is Frank Von Hipples, who was one of my advisors at Princeton when I was in graduate school. John Steinbrunner, who was my first boss at Brookings. These were powerful people in the movements that you've been associated with. And I'm sure you knew some of them and collaborated with some of them. And even though I never quite saw the problem just the same way they did, I always had their voice like yours sort of haunting my dreams and making me want to have an answer to the question of what's the vision for getting rid of nuclear weapons. And I'm afraid the conclusion I come to isn't going to please you entirely, but it, but it is a conclusion that is more forward looking than what a lot of people believe, a lot of realists who think we'll just never get rid of these weapons. And I think once we have established stability, among the great powers, the nuclear armed powers in particular, that that is a moment when we can seriously consider going to zero pretty fast. Now, what, is, what does it mean to have stability? Obviously, that's going to be a judgment call. And I thought we were getting closer in 2011 when I wrote the book. And then you and I and everybody else who hoped for a more peaceful, great power world were disappointed in the events of the next dozen years. So now I think we're further away than we used to be. But something smacking of the kind of relationships we had with Russia and China in the 1990s, but a little more stabilized and solidified. When we get to that world, I'm ready for zero nuclear weapons myself. So that's the best answer I can give you. Other questions? Naomi, I have a couple of comments coming in from uh, our viewers. So let okay. me just sort of quickly say them. Um, one was a question about whether you're familiar with the work of Richard Garvin. Another is um, a question about, um, in terms of um, Iran, would Iran possibly have smaller weapons that they could then, nuclear weapons that they could then use through a proxy uh, to aim at Israel or Saudi Arabia? Those are great questions. Okay, first of all, Thank you for bringing up Richard Garwin. I believe he lives near you, right? Isn't that his longstanding home region? And I, I, I believe he's still alive and in pretty good health, the last I heard. I have not seen him in over a decade. I know him well. I was very honored. One of, the, one of my favorite moments in my whole career is when he asked me to write a blurb for the book he wrote with a French physicist called um, uh, Megatons and Megawatts. And it was sort of his big vision for Hi. nuclear arms control in the post-Cold War world. Uh, those of you who don't know Richard Garwin, I'm guessing a lot of you do, because I do think he's from your general neighborhood. But he was one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb. When he was a 22-year-old graduate student, he helped figure out the kind of physical arrangement that would actually allow a fission mm -hmm. bomb 
you know, the kind that just does the chain reaction with uranium or plutonium to create temperatures and pressures that would then be channeled into another part of the same device. And before the fission detonation would blow up that secondary part of the of the bomb, it would heat hydrogen isotopes in that secondary part to such a high temperature and pressure, mimicking the interior of the sun, that they would create this fusion effect or hydrogen atoms coming together to then create helium and huge releases of energy, which of course is what's given us modern nuclear weapons and the most powerful ones because fission bombs, you know, are, are bad enough, but, but fusion bombs or thermonuclear bombs, they can be a, a hundred times more powerful. And Garwin, aware of what he had helped unleash, also then spent much of the rest of his career as a major activist in nuclear arms control. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I am very familiar with Richard Garwin. In fact, not only am I familiar with his work, I'm inspired by it, I've learned from it, and you brought a smile to my face just thinking about the guy. So thank you for the question. Uh, secondly, on Iran, it's an interesting question as to how small of a nuclear weapon Iran could build realistically, because we built weapons that could be carried by a single person at one point in the Cold War. Weapons that w weighed maybe, you know, a yeah. hundred, hundred pounds, but they were, they were not fusion weapons. They were fission weapons, I believe. And uh, they were designed to have, you know, very limited battlefield effects. Yeah. And, and so the possibility does exist of building a weapon like that and being able to move it around more easily than you would a larger weapon. But you also need to be very good at the physics. And it's, it's not clear that Iran would be able to figure out how to be that efficient unless they got a bomb design from Russia or China or North Korea, because North Korea might've gotten good bomb designs from China or Russia. So the bottom line is it's possible that if Iran got the bomb, it could also build small bombs. But by the way, even mid-sized bombs are not that easy to find. You know, even if your bomb weighs a few hundred kilograms and you, you put some lead shielding over the top of it, you can drive it around in a truck or you can sail it around on a ship and no one's going to know it's there. So it's a pretty scary proposition, uh, even if they can't miniaturize. But yes, there is the possibility they could, especially if they get an advanced design from an established nuclear power. Tyler, yeah, uh, Michael, thanks so much for a very uh, for a comprehensive review of uh, the proliferation issue. I want to ask you about the fact that the Biden administration clearly now intends to notably upgrade our nuclear capability domestically, and uh, you know they've they've uh, talked about a new ice a new class of ICBMs. Uh, a new class of uh, submarines that would, of course, launch ballistic missiles and other improvements uh, to the uh, uh, the airborne delivery of uh, missiles uh, with the uh, new bombers, such as the B-21. Uh, my question is, given the fact that apparently they don't intend, however, to start this process going until the, the uh, termination of the new start agreement, which, as you know, is early, uh, I'm sorry, early 2026. So I wonder, uh, how can one formulate an upgrade of one's nuclear capabilities if we have to wait over a year and a half before we could even theoretically start doing it? Or would we actually initiate improvements that perhaps might prove to be uh, provocative to other nuclear players, if you see what I'm getting at. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. And I think I have an answer to that question. But first, I have to ask you a question. Is that the Hudson River behind you? Is that your backdrop? No, no, that's Lake Champlain up ah. in, uh, yeah, near Burlington, yeah. south of Burlington. Yeah, yeah, for sure. My sister has a place up there, but I haven't been up to see it yet. Um, so I thought you were going to ask me an even harder question, <laughs> which is oh. why we should be spending $1.5 trillion on a nuclear modernization program uh, at a time when we're trying to control proliferation risks. But, and I could try to come back to that one, but to answer your question, no, we're not really constrained because the, all those programs that you mentioned are in development. They're not actually in production. 
And moreover, uh, we don't really design them as additions. We don't intend them right now to be additions to the arsenal so much as modernizations or substitutions. So for example, the existing fleet of ballistic missile submarines is getting old. And uh, sure, we wanna make the new fleet even quieter in terms of stealthy you know, movement underwater and essentially making it more or less invisible to sonar, if you will. But the main concern is just to make sure that our crews are safe because previous, you know, Ohio class submarines have been operating for decades. And at some point when you're operating pretty far down, you're, gonna, you're just gonna get metal fatigue and either need to rebuild the sub or replace it. So that's the driving impetus for the nuclear weapons modernization program in the sea-based part of the triad. Then with the ICBMs, similar kind of thing, our Minutemen have been around since John F. Kennedy and they've been upgraded and we replaced their fuel and things like that. But um, I was always interested in seeing if we could delay that program to save a little money in the short term, but we've effectively been delaying it by various kinds of program skip, uh, slips. And so, you know, it's, it's nowhere near ready for deployment right now and even if it were we would be doing one for one substitution taking out minutemen as we put in uh the new you know um long range strategic deterrent as it's called and then finally with the b21 bomber we need those for conventional military operations as well as nuclear operations so the good thing about the b21 it's stealthy and it can be used in the kinds of conflicts that we have been fighting for the last few decades uh, hopefully we won't fight too many more, but the United States being who we are with the interests and allies around the world that we've got, uh, I would want the B-21 for conventional missions as well. So um, we're going to go ahead and build that, whatever the state of arms control, I have no doubt. Uh, but I think it's still, I think it, it its first prototype was unveiled, I want to say a year ago. I was invited to the ceremony, but I couldn't go out in California. So they're still away from ways away from real production. But the concern you've got, it, you don't need to be worried about that. We're not going to delay just based on the timelines in the New START Treaty. Good. Thanks. Uh, Peter, is your hand raised? Yes. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that bracing discussion. Um, I wanted to come back a little bit to the, uh, the role and the dimension of the UN. Security Council and the Permanent Five, and link it with your comment about um, stability and the great power relationship. Uh, do you see that as a, kind of a balance of power model? And looking at the Security Council, there seems to be some movement towards uh, expanding uh, that uh, and bringing in some other countries. And would that dynamic help with arms control? Yeah, interesting questions. Well, let me first of all suspend disbelief, or maybe imagine we're into the year 2026 or 2028 and or 2030, and somehow either Vladimir Putin has agreed to a peace in Ukraine or hopefully been replaced. Because right now, I don't think there's any basis to do anything on any of the agenda that you just mentioned, given the state of great power relations. But let's let's imagine that we're in a little bit happier place and that maybe we could have the conversation. The problem is that when you start to get specific about who you wanna add, there's almost always a big problem. <laughs> so Japan is the obvious place to start because they have the third biggest economy in the world and have often been the top provider of international development assistance and have been a peaceful actor in East Asia for decades now after having been so guilty of atrocities and aggression in World War II. So a lot of people would put them at the top of the list, except not China. <laughs> China and Japan tend to have pretty tense relations, mostly because of the US-Japan alliance. And uh, China's gonna be jealous about the idea of an American ally now getting onto the Security Council when they're already a bunch. And then you might say, well, okay, let's balance that out with some other country that China likes better. But you know, China doesn't have any allies except North Korea. It does have a number of countries it's friendly with, but that does not include India. Because as you probably have followed carefully, China and India had a border fight a few years ago in which about 20 Indian soldiers were killed. 
apparently clubbed and you know knocked off cliffs uh, in the Himalayas over a border dispute. And more generally, the China-India relationship is tense. So even if you were willing to bring in India, that wouldn't really make China feel any happier. But India would have to be an obvious choice like Japan because it's the world's most populous country and is now, you know, in many ways, a leader in the developing world, if not the leader, and is economically impressive and also a nuclear weapon state. So moreover, if you then said, well, let's bring in Pakistan because China and Pakistan get along pretty well, then a lot of other countries with about 200 million population like Pakistan, to include Nigeria and Indonesia, are going to ask, and Brazil are going to ask, why not us? Are you just rewarding Pakistan because they went ahead and built nuclear weapons and funded terrorism? And so, you know, I've gone through this thought process trying to get specific, and I know a lot of other people have too. And the, the so the problem quickly becomes there's there's almost always an existing great power that's going to veto any particular new combination that you might propose. And moreover, the the established powers really don't want any company among the group of five that has the veto. They all like that veto. And so the only way you could realistically do this would be to have members that are permanent, but not with a veto. And that would make them sort of second class citizens, unless you got rid of our veto for the US, Britain, France, China, and Russia. But the existing five are not going to want to get rid of their own veto. And right now, of course, Russia and China see their veto as important protection against what could otherwise become a Western move to sanction them or otherwise isolate them. So it's a fascinating question. The answer could change someday, but I can't even suspend disbelief about the poor state of US-Russia relations and imagine a way to get to yes over the next five or 10 years. Even more things would have to change about global politics. And by the way, very last point, um, if you, if you wanted to say, well, even Brazil within Latin America, far and away the largest country, but you know what? A lot of the other Latin American countries resent Brazil for being the big power in the neighborhood. Familiarity does not always bring love. It often brings contempt or jealousy. Brazil's Portuguese speaking, the rest of the continent is Spanish speaking more or less. And so even if you thought you had a nice, easy, obvious answer for South America, just give the new South American permanent seat to Brazil, even that would be controversial. So I, I'm open to people coming up with ideas. Matthew may have a suggestion here too, but I just don't see how you get it done um, you know, on any realistic time horizon. Rune, do you have any, uh, Amy or Carolyn, any other questions? Amy has a question. Yeah, I know, I know time is short, but you know, I was thinking based I was still thinking about Matthew's questions and um, kind of this the what I see as a divergent set of dynamics. On the one hand, globally, we see increasing authoritarianism, right? Um, alternatively, we also see in robust democracies increasing activism, and a lot of that activism aimed against sort of great power politics and the involvement of great powers in other countries. And I wondered if those two trends um, have any impact in your mind on either US's nuclear policies and posture or the sort of global dynamics around nuclear weapons. Yeah, that's a nice question, Amy. And thank you for building on Matthew's earlier point. And I guess what I would say is this, because I, can't persuade myself that there's any near-term path towards uh, nuclear disarmament. And I also think even existing bilateral arms control is in trouble. And hopefully we can hold on to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which is, as you know, uh, essentially being respected by everybody except North Korea, even though the United States itself has not ratified that treaty. And and Donald Trump has occasionally made sounds about resuming nuclear testing. So I'm just hoping we can stem the, you know, stanch the bleeding essentially on arms control for, for the time being. But so I would sort of flip your question a little bit to the following. I would hope that activism and diplomacy in the broader developing world, uh, even, if, even if it can't achieve a near-term movement towards nuclear disarmament, 
could maybe use that issue and other issues to shame us into helping them in two other big ways where I think we are dropping the ball. And it's basically pandemic preparation and climate. And I think they deserve a lot more support and a lot more resources from the global north, if you will, especially on climate where we are the problem and they are often the victim. And the only way to move towards greener global energy use is it's going to include a lot of financial help for the global south writ large. And of course, on COVID, they didn't really get access to vaccines very fast and their economies were badly hurt. A lot of them went into further debt. They're still suffering from that. And we haven't really been forthcoming either with the vaccines on a rapid enough schedule or with the debt relief subsequently. So I would hope the activists, they can use the nuclear issue to shame us a little bit more, but maybe their more realistic victories would come in other realms where I think we also owe them a little bit of an apology and a little bit more help. But I, I think there's a more, even that would be hard, of course, coming up with substantial sums of money, but I think it's more plausible than forcing us down a path towards deeper nuclear cuts at a time when China's building up and Russia's suspending arms control agreements. And otherwise we're gonna do well just to sort of stabilize that situation before we can really get on a downward path again. Um, yes, so Michael, thank you so much. This has been, I think we could keep you here all day long, but uh, I guess we have to share you with other people. So, but thank you. I think you've given us a lot of things to think about. I think maybe I'm a little calmer. Um, Good. The press certainly has a way of sensationalizing and causing a lot of um, worry on all our parts without saying how actually complicated things are and um, that there may be um, other reasons that are, that there's maybe some rationality in, within the world or whatever. But um, in any case, thank you. Um, I also- I want to invite everybody also in two weeks to join us again on September 30. Our guest speaker then will be Sherwar Kashmiri, who from this from the Atlantic Council and is senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Association, and he will be speaking to us on NATO. So thank you very much, Michael. Um, and to everybody, welcome to our new members. Um in and Matthew, so much so. You're welcome anytime. Uh, it was a like to have you with us. So until two weeks, and um, we will still be following you, Michael, even when you're not with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the privilege. It was really fun today and happy, happy fall. Have a great fall, everybody. And again, thanks for your virtual hospitality and, uh, and co collegiality. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank, speaking for the library, thank you very much. And you just got a very interesting uh, chat. It's a clap. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. And don't forget to visit our website, chappaqualibrary.org. Bye. Thank you.